Um, Bula to you all, and good, good morning. Uh, thank you, John, for such a wonderful welcome, uh, warm welcome. I feel like I'm coming back home after six years of collaboration. And I really love this city, so beautiful. And it's so flat. <laughs> because Fiji is so mountainous, you cannot see your neighbor. So we fight a lot down in Fiji. We have a lot of coups because you don't see the neighbor. But here, it's so flat, and I, I like this place. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the invitation, uh, um, John. You know, I'm so honored and uh, I'm so happy and privileged um, that I'm invited to this wonderful occasion. I think it is a historical occasion because it has never happened before, I believe. And uh, I hope it's going to become a frequent occasion and you can invite me uh, more, more in, the, in the future. But thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Lean, David. Uh, those, uh, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, Diana, uh, Sayed, and those in the uh, conference committee for inviting me to this um, uh, um, conference and giving me the opportunity to share my experience uh, back home. Now, I will tell you a story. I hope it won't be a boring story and make you sleep after all the wine and uh, after all the pizza last night. So. But let me, a story, let me tell you a story about a small university. Perhaps it may, you may not even hear or heard about this university. A small one, um, almost drowning there in the, in the South Pacific. I'll talk about this university and why we think that we should adopt a model uh, for engaged learning and teaching as an institution across the board. Why we think that it, it is important for our future generation. So I'll go through all the, uh, the reasons why we, we think we should adopt a model, and then finally, why we adopted the RSD, and how we came about adopting the RSD. So let me start first with uh, um, telling the story about my university. As you can see, it is, it is all blue out there. And uh, you can see that you've got a beautiful big country on the left-hand uh, side of the screen. Um, this university is unique in the sense that it is owned by 12 island countries. What are these island countries? You can see that right up in the north, you have Marshall Islands then that's up in the Micronesia, Marshall Islands. The Micronesian countries are the Marshall Islands, Nauru, Kiribati. And then you move towards the east, you have the Polynesians, Tokelau, Samoa, Niue, Cook Islands. Just missing out the French territories of Tahiti and New Caledonia. Then down to the south, you've got Fiji, uh, and the east, north, east, south, west, you've got Vanuatu and Solomon Islands. And uh, Papua New Guinea is now giving us its interest, showing us its interest to join the university, become larger. Uh, but uh, we are 12 member countries. The university was established by our colonial rulers. Uh, during those days, uh, it was Great Britain. So Great Britain established uh, this university in 1968. We've got campuses right throughout the region, which covers an area of about 33 million square kilometers. And uh, our students spread throughout the region, about 27,000 students altogether. When the university was established, fortunately we were helped by the Israelites, Israel government. They gave us a satellite, which we still using until to this day, we use the satellite uh, to transmit our, our classes. Of course, the internet is now available, so now we have online classes as well. But the satellite is our main mean of communication. It's very, very important to us. Uh, now that uh, the, the undersea uh, cable is being laid from country to country, we are using those cables now, uh, but still, the backbone of our communication is a satellite uh, donated to us by the Israel government.
Now, I want to talk about the, the council, which is uniquely a very powerful council <laughs> in the sense that it's almost working on a daily basis with uh, academics on the ground. We can feel there instantly a any um, decision made by the council on the ground. Um, the university charter was developed in 1970 and was presented to the Queen uh, in, 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 the, in the United Kingdom. And in that charter, uh, it talks about the council whose permanent members are the 12 ministers of education from 12 member countries. And interest interestingly, we've got a representative from your government, which is so wonderful. And in fact, the Australian government has been so supportive of the university that really owe you a lot, and I'll show you why in a minute. Uh, the uh, Australian government and the New Zealand government are permanent members as well. And of course, we've got the staff and student reps. But these are the core members. And they have meetings every year, twice a year, one in May, where they, uh, they have a meeting in one of the member countries, and one in December, in November, where they have it in, in Lodala, in Suva, where the main campus is. Now you see that it, is, it was your influence, and it is still your influence, the, the Australians, that we exist. Uh, so we owe you a lot, uh, actually, and I'll show you why in a minute, uh, how you have played so much um, uh, uh, supportive role and important role in the life of this small university. The main campus is in Suva, Lodala campus. It got a very interesting background, I'll tell you in a minute, but uh, anyway, why is it that Australia and New Zealand are important uh, in the exist for the existence of this university? They are what we call the development partners. The main development partners are the Australian and the New Zealand governments. And they provide funding directly to our budget. If you look at the budget, you see that, uh, for example, in 2015, almost uh, $200 million Fiji dollars, that's about 100 million Australian dollars, uh, was our budget in 2015. You notice that color, that uh, yellow color? That is a contribution from you. So for, uh, in, in 2015, out of about $180 million, Fiji dollars, you and the New Zealand government contributed $50 million. And therefore, I'm so grateful from my heart for your help. And you see, right throughout the history of USB, you can see that you were helping us right throughout 50 years of existence of the university. Um, the member countries, the 12 member country, countries, they contribute, in fact, less, lesser than your contribution and New Zealand's contribution. For example, in 2015, the member countries contributed only $49 million. And uh, the student fees, from the students' fees, we, ha we had uh, $54 million. But from you and New Zealand, uh, $50 million. And from the other donors like Japan, United States, uh, and also from our commercial activities, uh, $34 million. So that's why you are very, very important. And I guess when the uh, colonial powers set up uh, the university, they had in mind the sustainability and therefore installed within the council your representatives and the New Zealand representatives, which I'm very grateful that it happened. They had the foresight to do that. The main campus is located uh, at uh, Lodala Bay, and it's got a very interesting um, history as well. It was the site of the 5th Squadron of the Royal New Zealand Air Force, which is still in existence now, but of course in New Zealand. And in fact, they've got a Fijian motto. It is, if you can read the motto from there, it says, Keito Kalawada na Wasaliwa. It means, we span the ocean. Literally, it means, we take a step from one island to another island. 
it is such a beautiful motto and uh, it kind of reflective in what happened what is happening today because our students they be our former students alumni uh, as i will show you in a minute they have become prime ministers and presidents they move from one island to another as if as if they are giants so the new zealand air force uh, they um, they developed the place and uh, now we've got a campus. It's a big campus. Um, but in 1968, it looked like something like that. Uh, now you can see that, uh, uh, that plane. That place now, we have a lower a campus called the Marine Campus. Um, but it, of course, it's developed since then. But this is the history of our main campus in, in Suva. As I mentioned, that um, over the last 50 years, actually, because we were <clears throat> came into existence in 1968, almost all the former prime ministers and the present prime ministers and presidents of the Pacific Island countries graduated from the University of the South Pacific. They spanned the, the region. There are giants now in the area. For example, the current Prime Minister of Tonga, Akisi Pohiva, uh, the President of Kiribati currently, Taneti Mamau, uh, the former uh, Prime Minister of Tuvalu, Pekini Peu Painu, um, the former President of Nauru, Ludwig Scotty, and the former Prime Minister of Vanuatu, Joe Nataman, and so forth. They were all former students of the University of the South Pacific. So the University of the South Pacific had a great impact on the societal and economic development of the Pacific region. Now that we are entering into, moving into the new millennium, we are now experiencing great societal challenges and great learning and teaching challenges, actually. So what I'll do now next is touch on some of these challenges that prompted us to adopt the RSD. You can see the profile of our students, and immediately we'll note, you can conclude immediately that English is not our first language. This is one of the if not the major challenge facing uh, lecturers, uh, teachers at the University of the South Pacific. How to get our students to write legible English, to write a paragraph of clear English, how to speak properly in English. Why it is important? Well, we have decided to adopt English, and therefore we must do all our best to learn English. For many, for almost all of our students, as you can see in the profile, English is the second language. In fact, for many more, English is the third language. For my case, English is the third language. My father is from Melanesia, he's a Fijian, but my mother is from up the north, from Micronesia, from Gilbert Islands. So I speak Fijian at home, and I speak Gilberis, now Kiribati, at home. But I have to go to school and study English. So English is my third language. So excuse my accent then. But this is the major challenge for us. And you'll see that when we start to look at solutions, this is one of the solutions that, this is one of the issues that we addressed head on. Even though we've got 50 years of existence. After 50 years of existence, we realize that if we don't tackle persistent problems like this, then uh, clearly and effectively, we'll continue to have problems in the future. So we're working with high schools and primary schools as well. In fact, we have provided the solutions to, to our educational systems across the region. We have told them that look, 
The only way to understand English, the only way to use English, is to start reading. That's it. That's the solution. Just read books. So in schools, we have wonderful novels like um, The Boy He Was Afraid, I Am David. These are wonderful novels that we start adopting in high schools. All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, and um, this emphasis on reading, reading, reading uh, is now being basically carried out by, our, our, by the University of South Pacific. However, the advent of the internet is challenging that again. Now our students are not reading textbooks. They're going Google, they're Googling things. So the question is how do we address the issue of, of reading and at the advent of the internet? So these are really, you know, this is really a great challenge for us at the university. And this is one of the big issues that we want to address as we move into the next millennium. The other challenge that we've got is the, um, after the, our colonial powers withdrew from the Pacific, we stopped offering, for example, the New Zealand University entrance examination. When I was at the university the, way back in the 1980s, I did the New Zealand school certificate, which means that if I pass form six or year 12, I think that's year 12, I can go to any New Zealand, any New Zealand high school. Then I did the New Zealand university entrance, which means that if I pass that exam, I, I can go to any New Zealand university. When, became, when we became independent in 1970, slowly but surely, our educational system started to get eroded. The state of labs, for example, physics labs, chemistry labs, are worsening day by day if you go to uh, schools now around the Pacific region. And so the emphasis on STEM is declining. The effect is that we'll see the concept of teamwork, RSD, the concept of critical thinking, creativity, are now come into question. Uh, they become more difficult to achieve. If we don't address English properly, we will have difficulty in writing, communication skills, graduate attributes. Yes. So science is another area where we are lagging behind because of our high school system, and the university is helping out the uh, educational systems of the South Pacific Island countries to strengthen their science program, their STEM program. And therefore, hopefully from that, uh, we will get uh, good critical thinkers, team uh, workers, those with creative skills, and so forth. So these are the two major challenges of the, of the learning and teaching environment back home. Interestingly, we found out that uh, some Solomon Islanders, for example, they don't, know where, they don't know where Kiribati is. They don't know the culture of Nauru, for example. Uh, those in Tonga, they absolutely don't know anything at all about the Solomon Islanders and their culture. Even though we are based in, right there in the Pacific Islands. So we need to t start telling us, our students that it is important to know yourself first and have pride in your culture before you can venture out into the world. So the concept of Pacific consciousness is important for us in the region. Know thyself first. Now, we identified those three major uh, uh, learning and teaching challenges. In the meantime, we are facing great societal challenges as we moved into, as we entered into the new millennium. And some of these are well-known ones. Let me just uh, give some examples. Governance. If we don't teach our students to be professional in the approach about life, to be ethical, to be good leaders, ethical leaders, then we have problems like this. In 2002, we had a coup in Fiji, the third or fourth coup. Then in 2006, 
issue of governance is important. In Tonga in 2006, there was a riot against the monarchy system and against the foreigners. They burned down Nuku Alofa. In Solomon Islands, ethical conflict. That's why you had to send uh, your sons and daughters, Australians, to Solomon Islands. Why? Because the, the essence of how to behave and how to teach that behavior is missing. And we believe that it's the university's role to do that, governance. Then, of course, you've got the environmental problem. Um, the climate change is now drowning most of the islands. What are the solutions? Sea level rise is basically drowning Tokelau, uh, Kiribati, and the coastal areas of many of all the Pacific Island countries. What are the solutions? NCDs, obesity. And um, now we are calling it the silent tsunami, the deaths from NCDs. And uh, this term was introduced by the South Pacific Commission. And this, doc this, um, this news article was just published uh, last month in October. Sorry, yeah, October 21st, 2017. And they, they're calling these, the NCDs, they're calling that the silent tsunami. We are too obese. And so the depiction that you can see there in the movie Moana is probably correct. And um, once in a while, I think I would like to be uh, like, um, rather than that person, I want to look like The Rock, you know? You know, the someone, The Rock, is a handsome bloke and with full of muscles and, <laughs> but not like that type, there, you know? In the Moana, but that's, but that's a true depiction of the Pacific Islanders. I'm almost the same size, as, same height as John, but I'm fatter than you, John. <laughs> then we found a very interesting phenomenon. After 50 years of existence, we started looking to the data, and we wanted to know where our graduates are ending up where our graduates are going to. We found out that the majority of them are, were becoming or are becoming civil servants. And then about 40% civil servants, about 40% migrated after five or six years after, after graduation. Uh, they migrated to New Zealand and Australia mainly. And 20% do something else. They did some, uh, do something else in life. But about 40% of, of our graduates are ending up as civil servants. Now, there's nothing to be alarmed about because we don't have the industry like you have to absorb our graduates. But we at the University of the South Pacific start to getting more worried than the others. Why is that? Because when we, when we look at the data, <clears throat> we understand that uh, the, the majority of the civil servants, they have only the undergraduate degree. You can see from the data in 2016, uh, 2015, for example, out of the 27,000 students, only 2,000, or only about 2,900 students are postgraduate students. They are trained in research, to do research. They are masters and PhD students. So what's the implication of this? The implication of this is that all these civil servants, they do not have the skills to help their government. They don't have, they cannot, basically they cannot analyze data. They cannot look at a data and look at patterns. Um, they cannot analyze, they cannot advise the government on how it should do it, its work, economically, socially. 
that is the implication of, of having a large civil servant with no research skills, with no critical thinking skills. Because the data is telling us that it's only about 11%, 10%. Every year, we've got only this minimal number of students who've got research skills. And it turns out that the majority of these students, anyway, when they graduated, they migrated immediately. So only a few um, remain, and uh, the, the, the effect, uh, the overall effect of the contribution to the society is basically minimal, basically nothing at all. And that is our worry now, knowing that uh, with a large civil services in, these, in our member countries, we have basically a thing, ticking bomb whereby um, governments cannot progress economically, socially, because of the limited skills that, uh, that our students had or the civil servants have. And that is why we started to look around. Given all the learning and teaching problems that we've got, two major ones, English, science, societal problems that we had, we have uh, climatic and health and so forth. And with this problem here, where we have a large number of graduates with limited skills, we have to do something. So, in 2010, the University Council took on the horn of the bull, as it were. <laughs> Time to fight the, um, the nemesis. Time to do something. We now realize our problem. After 50 years of existence, we've seen the data. Time to do something to challenge the new, to, to address the new challenges of the new millennium. So in 2010, the, the uh, council basically decreed that we undertake a comprehensive academic review, we call it STAR, with the core um, aim, objective, that the university should produce graduates with research literacy and skills to help address the environmental, the economic, the social and cultural challenges that face our region. So now you see why we start to look around for help, to help us in this, in this endeavor. And the good thing about it is that the council, it comes from, the, this directive came from the council. So in other words, it is really uh, it knows, it, it, it is addressing the issues very, very seriously. And the only tool which it can use at this point in time is the University of the South Pacific. And to use the University of the South Pacific to address this fundamental problem uh, that we are facing uh, in the region. So, just to summarize that first part of the presentation before I go, and how we identified the great RSD. So from 1968 to 2018, next year, we'll be celebrating our 50th, uh, 50 years of existence. We, we have produced leaders, but come year 2000, we are now within the new millennium. We are now seeing new challenges, environmental, health-wise, and the internet, um, the advent of the internet, which to some extent is worsening the, uh, worsening the English uh, proficiency skills, but it could be used to improve, and that's where we need uh, educators like you. We have produced good leaders, that's fine, but what do we want to see in our students, in our graduates, after 2018? What kind of students do we want to see? So, we decided to take, we decided to do three things. In 2010, we decided to develop our, or relook at our graduate attributes so that they can be addressing the issues that I mentioned. And once we understand 
the graduate attributes, then we need to do a few other things, like uh, the development of compulsory courses and like the adoption of the RSD. So that when we have graduates coming out of 2018, we hope that they will have more imagination. Imagination is more important than knowledge, than cramming knowledge. They become critical thinkers, problem solvers, so that we can tackle all the societal problems that we are now facing. Developing the uh, graduate attributes was relatively easy because we've been doing this for the past 50 years and we learn from, from others. So they're typically um, almost similar to other universities, but you notice that they're addressing things, they're addressing issues that I've just uh, highlighted. For example, uh, teamwork, communication, uh, Pacific consciousness, governance via ethical uh, ethics, innovation, creativity, critical thinking, and, and so forth. And uh, this encompass the, the graduate attributes like academic excellence, typical ones, intellectual curiosity, integrity, capacity for leadership that will address the issue of governance and working for others, appreciation of the cultures of the Pacific Islands, Pacific consciousness, and cross-cultural cross competencies. We need to know more about English, study English, and so forth, communication. So that was relatively easy to, to develop. The next thing that we did was to basically develop courses that all university students, they must take before they graduate, compulsory. We call these courses UU courses, and um, uh, they will be an example of um, UU 204, Pacific World, in, uh, in the presentation this afternoon. But we want our students to know about ICT when they go out there in the, in the, in the, in, uh, in the um, get employed. They must know how to use the computer. Uh, they must be IT literate. After working with high schools, making sure that a high school system they adopt this reading habit. We also have another extra English course called, called uh, English for Academic Purposes. This is for English proficiency. All the, the problems that we've been having in the region, the, uh, the coups in Fiji, the riot in Tonga, in Solomon Islands, that's why we must have um, a... Professor Man, 
uses of planet. It was wonderful, and thank you, John, the team, thank you, University of Adelaide, thank you, Adelaide, for accepting us in the visit in August, 29th of August to September 2011. The transfer of knowledge was taking place. We started learning about what is the RSD is all about in order to address the issue of, of critical thinking skills. Change skills. What was the outcome of the visit? We found out that the RSD embraces all of our graduate academics. And that's a wonderful thing about it. We managed to draw this and show exactly where the RSD concept fit, fits perfectly into our graduate academics. For this reason, it was the, um, the senior management accepted our recommendation. What are those recommendations? That uh, we adopt the RSD framework and that we set up $200,000 to implement that. It's a top-down approach. And because we argued with it strongly and favorably, the senior management team accepted our recommendation. And so in 2012, we started the implementation. And we began immediately with those compulsory courses, because we know that all our students have to take these compulsory courses and therefore, they have to meet the RSD in at least seven subjects or compulsory courses. And uh, we are now implementing the RSD um, via our training, using it as a marketing rubric. Uh, and now we're about to monitor what we've done the last six years. Since 2012 and 2016, we've had 16 workshop trainings conducted by the University of Adelaide by John and his team. So thank you, John, for that. coming over to Fiji and looking at um, those guys there in Fiji. And uh, there's a boring place in Fiji that I showed you. But thanks, John. 16 workshops we have. We have trained 500 academics now. And we have got a community of practice which means uh, every month. And the current stage is that we implement 80%. When we talk about 80% implementation, it means that we have implemented the RSD in at least one of the mode, modes of teaching. We've got three modes of teaching, face-to-face, -face, online, and blended. Blended means mixture of everything. So the idea is that if we um, implemented the RSD in one of the courses, embed the RSD in one of the, one of the modes, then our definition of 80% uh, implementation level. Uh, so we've got 80% implementation level in 81 courses uh, across 25 disciplines. All three levels, that is the first, the second, and third year. Uh, or, right, eight disciplines in the first, second, and third year levels. And uh, we've got all our first year and final level courses are the postgraduate courses. We all now have the barriers uh, in the last six years. And what is the future? How do we go ahead in the future? Now we want, to, we want to evaluate, of course. That's the first thing we'll do next year, uh, evaluate what we've done. But we would like to have a program uh, implementation. And that is we want to see which programs we can implement the RSD within. And then we want to have coincidence as we move from one course to another within that program. So it's program implementation from next year onwards. Um, we've got the website there. and. Um, I'm more than happy to invite you to please um, visit this website and because we can share with you everything that we have done, all the, the, the other resources, all the rubrics that we've got, all our reports that we have uh, is there on the website. Just type in research dot and uh, go to share skills and everything is there. All the testimonies. Everything that we've done with respect to RSD, all the rubrics of courses are there. For example, um, the RSD handbooks which we developed for us, for our university, there are three, three of them. And 
you can go to the undergraduate generic courses, the EU courses, and uh, look at all the, the, uh, the uh, rubrics for the foundation courses, for the undergraduate courses, for the postgraduate courses. Like a two-hour I'm more than happy to share. <laughs>